Good morning. I pray you are well today and that you are rejoicing in the faithfulness of the Lord. Uh, circumstances change and situations can be different from day to day. But our God is the same from eternity past and to the eternity future. Our God is one and the same. He is faithful. It's good to be with you today by means of this video. I hope you are being able to uh, benefit, to enjoy, and to glean from God's Word as Pastor Robert and I seek to keep giving you the Word even though it is in a virtual way. A couple of things I'd mentioned to you before we have prayer. We certainly want to be in prayer for our nation. These are challenging times for our leaders. I heard today that there's some 26 million unemployed Americans. And surely that represents a lot of homes, a lot of families, a lot of small businesses, and that people are hurting. And we're praying that this will soon come to an end and that, that people can be able to return back to their, to their jobs. And so I urge you to pray that with the mercy of the Lord that there would be wisdom uh, for our state and national leaders. And that while there will be times where it'll be probably very frightening to think about, but the courage to take the next step. And so pray that our governor will indeed have the courage to make the right decisions at the right time. And then too, I want to thank you very much for your prayers on behalf of a young man uh, that I have uh, told you about by our group email. A uh, little feller, uh, Kendall Huffman, is a 14-year-old who tragically accidentally was shot just a few days ago. And yet, amazingly, the Lord has blessed and some very good progress has been made. Still challenges, still need for your prayers. But I do rejoice with the goodness of the Lord upon this young man and upon his family. And I've heard so many good things. And so we say to God be the glory for all he has done. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and after the prayer, we're going to have a song, and it's a recording of us as a congregation singing a real good song, and it's called, He Will Hold Me Fast. He, God, will hold me fast. And perhaps you today need to be reminded of that truth. Jesus spoke about being in His hand and in the Father's hand, and that no one can take you out of the hand of the Father. Romans chapter 8 tells us there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God will hold you fast. You're one of His children. You know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. You can count on it. He'll hold you fast. Now you may be going through something very difficult right now, but God will not forsake you and God will not forget you. So as the words come on the screen, read those words as it is sung to you and just worship the Lord with gratitude of that biblical truth. He will hold me fast. Now let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you indeed that goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives. We thank you that even though heaven and earth will pass away. Your word will remain. And we bless you that from generation to generation, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us, Lord, in our weakness. The psalmist said, you remember our frame that we're made of dust. And so, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, when life is frightening to us, when things seem so hard to understand, help us to lean hard upon you and stand upon your word. And even this wonderful song that you have taught us to sing, may it minister grace to all who are listening or who are viewing today. Lord, I pray you'll bless your people. 
I pray you'll encourage your people, Lord. We pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray for wisdom and courage. Wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless, that we could see the reopening of our communities, our state, our nation. We pray for the 26 million Americans today who are without work. We pray for all those small businesses, Lord, that are hurting right now. And we we would pray, Lord, that they might soon be able to reopen and people could return back to their jobs. But Lord, I pray in all of this, it would teach us, Lord. May we not return to the people we were, but may we instead, dear Lord, turn from how we were and turn to you, our God, in repentance and in faith. And so, Lord, may it, may it serve, dear Lord, to be a, a brokenness and yet also a blessing, to bless us, Lord, with a renewal, with a revival, dear Lord, that we will turn to you, our God, and that, Lord, you then, Lord, would be pleased to heal the land. So, Lord, we thank you. Bless our brothers and sisters who meet across the county today, your body of Christ, dear Lord, the church, as people hear the word of God, Bless all the means that we're using today to get the word out, Father. And so to God be the glory. Great things you have done, are doing, and will do. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.
hope you have your Bible nearby. I want to invite you to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalm, Psalm number 1. And in just a little bit, we will read that psalm. You know, as we are considering the situation that we are in, yea, the whole world is in, but in particular, as I think about our own nation, I've made two uh, observations about our current circumstances. One, it is interesting to see how that we Americans can do without things that heretofore have been treated as almost indispensable. Uh, for instance, our social life is practically non-existent. But that's not all bad, is it? Families are spending more time together, and that's a good thing. But the second observation I have made is something that I find even more interesting, and perhaps you have uh, picked up on it also. In the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, we are witnessing the acceptance of boundaries, of limitations and restrictions by a society that has to a great extent rejected the notion of boundaries and restrictions and, and limitations. For instance, you, you, you go in a store and the, the, the floor is marked where you're to stand uh, while waiting to check out. Or uh, Sophie and I, we, we were in a store not too long ago and they had their aisles marked with one-way signs. In other words, you were just to go down that aisle one way. I took my wife to the doctor, and probably some of you have had this experience as well, and that is when we arrived, she went to the door. Uh, one of the staff uh, met her at the door, gave her instructions. She came back to the vehicle, sat with me until someone came outside and summoned her to come inside of the office. She recently did a, uh, an appointment with her doctor over the phone. It was strictly a, a conversation. And then if you're banking, if you're not banking online, uh, you're banking in line going through the drive through And so in just a matter of weeks, uh, social distancing has become not only a household term, but an unquestioned and accepted way of life. I mean, it's, it has it has permeated us as a people in our thinking and our actions. We just naturally now keep our distance. I uh, recently took my truck to a dealership for service. And when I went into the waiting area, they, they didn't have any markings, any kind of, any kind of indications of where to sit, but the people just had naturally scattered. And this man or this couple would be sitting here and, and then there would be a space before someone else would be seated. And so I had to look around to find me a, a place to sit. And so I, I went to the far end and, and, and I saw what I, I thought to be a, a noticeable gap and that I judged to be six feet plus. And so I took my seat and immediately the person nearest to me, a lady, she gathered up her things and moved. So apparently um, our judging uh, of distance differed, and I, I, I felt bad about that, but I thought we were far enough apart. But, but it's so ingrained in us already of these boundaries and these, of these limitations. And so while it's a general practice now that in fact some 26 million Americans are currently unemployed, and it's all because of an enforcement of boundaries, limitations. And so I ask you, isn't it ironic that a society that is so boundary conscious, at the same time, to a great degree, has cast off all moral restraints? and yet so willingly practices social distancing. For instance, where are the boundaries today of marriage and sexual relations in our society? Hard to see, isn't it? Hard to find, hard to detect. 
fornication, which is generally regarded as premarital sex, adultery, extramarital sex, homosexuality, same-sex relations, are all violations of boundaries given by our God in His Word. Here are these two verses. Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 4, 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Do you know if our nation would abide by those two verses, we would be much better morally and socially. For you see, those two verses give us boundaries, limitations, and restrictions about very important matters in our lives. And yet we as a country are saying, no, we don't want those boundaries. And so I want you to look with me today at Psalm 1. And the title of my message is Spiritual Distancing. Psalm 1, Spiritual Distancing. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now this psalm is, is spoken of a man. But ladies, I hope you appreciate that the principles and the precepts of this psalm apply equally to you. It's spoken to an adult. And so I hope you young people and children understand that what is taught here also applies to you as well. But let's break down this psalm now and let's think about this blessed man and what the scripture is teaching us about him. In verse number one, first of all, the blessed man distances himself from wickedness. He distances himself from wickedness. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. There's something unique about this man that you and I should desire to learn and to emulate. A few things we can mention about this guy. First of all, the man's distancing results from a disciplined lifestyle. There is a way he does walk and there's a way he does not walk. Where does he walk? Where does he stand? And where does he sit? You see, it's just not anywhere. He's not careless about this. He's disciplined about his life. And the result of that discipline is it puts a distance from wickedness. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You see, the picture here, very similar to that in Deuteronomy and in Psalm 1, is a matter of lifestyle. In other words, it results from a disciplined lifestyle, the way this guy lives. You know, social distancing is promoted to hopefully help to deter the spread of sickness. Spiritual distancing is to deter the spread of sin. You see, we have to be disciplined in our life because we do live in a fallen world. And if we are careless and we walk close to the ways of the world, 
we will be vulnerable to the sin. I mean, we've got enough problems on the inside of us to deal with that we don't need to expose ourselves to the prevalence of sin that is all around us. We need to discipline ourselves in order to keep a distance from the wickedness. <coughs> and so the man's distancing results from a disciplined lifestyle. Let me ask you, are you careful about your steps? The Bible teaches us to walk in wisdom. The old English word is to walk circumspectly. I can still hear preacher Harold Fletcher saying this years ago. He said, walking circumspectly is a woman on high heels walking on ice. A woman wearing high heels walking on ice. That brother was from uh, the, the western part of the state where it's a little hillier and where they tend to get a little bit more winter weather than we do. And imagine walking on ice, a lady wearing high heels. She would want to be very careful, wouldn't she? And see, that's what the scripture teaches. We need to be careful. We need to be disciplined in our life or we're going to, we're going to get too close and we will endanger ourselves with the spiritual viruses that are all around us. So a disciplined lifestyle. The man's distancing also reflects a devoted loyalty. All right, he's disciplined not to walk, stand, or sit with wickedness. Well, then instead, what is he committed to? There's a loyalty now to something and someone else. He understands where the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Well, then what's the, re the opposite of that? Good company promotes good habits, you see. So there is a loyalty here, and I hope you understand that that loyalty is first and foremost to Jesus Christ. For to me to live, Paul said, is what Christ and to die is gain. And so if we're going to be like this blessed man, and we're going to distance ourselves from wickedness, not only do we need a disciplined lifestyle, but we need a devoted loyalty. Uh, a verse that comes to my mind quite often is in Hebrews 12, where it tells us to keep looking unto Jesus. That is not a glimpse. That's a gaze. Fix your eyes on Jesus. The songwriter wrote, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. You look at Jesus. You keep looking at him. A devotion to Christ. Also, the man's distancing reveals a, a declared Lord. There is someone in this man's life now who is, if you please, calling the shots. That, that, that there is someone now who, who has a sway over his life, who, who influences him, and thus he's not listening to the world's voice, and he's not even, not even listening to his own desires. He's listening to another one who has now the, the charm of his life that has had such an effect upon his life, all other voices are drowned out. Rami Zacharias, in his book, Jesus Among Other Gods, said this as a personal testimony. The Jesus I know and love today, I encountered at the age of 17. But his name and his tug in my life mean infinitely more now than they did when I first surrendered my life to him. I came to him because I did not know which way to turn. I have remained with him because there's no other way I wish to turn. I came to him longing for something I did not have. I remain with him because I have something I will not trade. I came to him as a stranger. I remain with him in the most intimate of friendships. I came to him unsure about the future. I remain with him certain about my destiny. Do you hear what's being said there? That Jesus Christ now means all the world to him, means more than the world to him. Jesus Christ is the, the attention of his life. And so thus, like, like this man here whom the Bible 
uh, describes as blessed, a happy man, a man who has distanced himself from wickedness. That here is a man by his lifestyle, by his loyalty, and because of his Lord is living the life he now lives. And the Bible says there is a blessed man. But now let's build on that and notice the second thing. Not only distance himself from wickedness, but the blessed man deliberates on the word. Do you note in verse 2? But, what a contrast. He's not, he's not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. He's not standing in the path of sinners, and he's not sitting in the seat of the scornful. Instead, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Think about what it says now about this man, this unique individual that the Bible says is blessed. Three things I could conclude from this statement here in verse number two. That for this guy, it's a matter of the heart. He loves the word, but his delights is in the law of the Lord. In other words, the attractions of the world, which are really distractions from the Lord, are withstood and rejected because of his preference for the Word of God. His delight is in the law of the Lord. You know, when you have fed yourself properly, then the dainties that the world would try to dangle before you to come and feast upon will not attract you. When you're full, when you're full of the good things of the Lord, you will not have as strong of a temptation for the things of the world. Feed yourself on the Word of God. Fill yourself full with the riches of His truths. So the world, when it tries to dangle its diets before you and wants you to come and participate in those things, instead say, no, I am full already. I'm not hungry for that. I have fed my appetite with the Word of God. It's a matter of the heart. He loves the Word. It's also a matter of the head in that he learns the Word. See what he said? And in his law, he meditates day and night. Well, meditate, what's that mean? He's thinking about it. He's dwelling on it. He is, as I said, deliberating on the Word. Now, what happens, what are the consequences when we faithfully meditate on the Word of God? Now, now obviously, that, that requires reading the Scriptures, but then reflecting upon the Scriptures, recalling, thinking, pondering the Word of God. What are two healthy consequences of doing that? Well, one is the matter of our understanding. There will be growth in our understanding. The Bible says in Proverbs 1, verse 1 and 2, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. I like to tell new believers, young Christians, stay in the word, stay in the word. Now pray before you read the Bible. After you've read the Bible, pray some more, but stay in the Word. Because in time, what's going to happen is you'll start to connect the dots. You will start to see how this passage relates to, relates to this passage. How this truth that is taught in the Old Testament is expounded upon in the New Testament. You'll just start to see how some things begin to link together or as I say, connect the dots. Now, the Bible is a profound book, and we'll study it all the days of our lives, but you can have some understanding. But it will require, it will require 
some deliberating, some thinking, some meditating, asking questions, pondering, pondering. Not, not, just, a, not just a quick uh, drive through, but rather that you stop and you stay yourself upon a passage and you think on it. As you perhaps have heard said that the word meditate here is, is what the old cow does. It, it regurgitates and it, and it once again chews the cud. That's what you're doing in the Bible. You're chewing that scripture. And there's so many juices of rich truth in the Bible that if, if you barely just, just barely sample it, you're not going to appreciate what it's saying. Because the more you go to a passage, there's more truth. Don't think because you studied something, I got that one all covered. I'm, I'm through there. I can move on to others. Well, you might move on to others, but you didn't get it all. Because the Bible is a living word. And there are many wonderful nuggets of truth in a passage. And so you want to give time to it and think on it, dwell on it, and see all the rich things God will give you from that passage. So there's understanding. The second consequence is the matter of faith. Now the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, what happened initially also happens continually. Initially, there was a time when you heard the word of God. Maybe it was a sermon, maybe you were at a church service or whatever might have been the situation, if somehow or another you were exposed to the Word of God. And it might not have been that first time, but at some point, that Word that was given to you sponsored faith. And what you had previously disbelieved, you repented and believed. You received that truth. And do you know the same thing is still happening even as a Christian? that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And so you see how important it is then to, to dwell on it, to, to deliberate, to meditate on the Word of God? What you're doing is you're affording yourself the opportunity of being exposed to truths that once they get in you, they serve to, to sponsor faith, and it causes faith to rise to the surface. You, a truth, a truth, and you embrace it. And that faith then is developed in your, in your life. Are you robbing yourself? Is your faith in the conditions in because you have basically starved your faith? You have not fed it with the Word of God? Are you finding yourself struggling over things at once you really believed and embraced? But now there's a question mark because You've left out the nourishment of your faith. You're not going to the Word of God, and your faith is very weak and anemic. Friend, let me encourage you. You need a steady diet of God's Word, but not just to read it, but then to reflect on it. Think over it. Mull it over in your mind and think through it. Have time to meditate on it. We're such a rush, rush society today. We're the drive through I mean, we're, we're all this instant things today. We're the microwave age. We, we want it now. Well, there are things God will teach you in this blessed Word, but you're going to have to be able to wait upon the Lord and exercise the discipline of your mind to think on these things. And so it's a matter of the heart. He loves the Word. It's a matter of the head. He learns the Word. But there's another thing, and I use other scripture to support this now, but it's also a matter of habit. And that is that he lives the word. Now, habit's a good word because not only are there bad habits, there's our good habits. And obedience is a good habit, right? It should be a lifestyle. It'd be something that we practice, that we should do on a regular basis, and that is be obedient. Joshua 1.8 is very similar to Psalm 1, verse 2. It just has more in it than Psalm 1, verse 2 has. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Now that's pretty much what Psalm 1, 2 says. But then Joshua 1, 8 goes on to say, 
that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And it's important to love the Word. It's important to learn the Word. But it's just as important also that we live the Word. God is not interested in just loading us up with information about the Bible. What we learn, we are learning to live. That is, we apply it in our lives. And so here here is the nature of a blessed man. That instead of wasting his life by the enticements of the world to walk, to stand, to sit in its wickedness, he turns away from that. And it's like a song I used to hear when I was a boy. Take time to be holy. Spend time in secret with the Lord. That's what he does here. He has deliberated on the Word. Oh, he loves it. He's learning that he might live. You see, there's the blessing. There's the blessing. It goes full circuit. What he loves, he's learning. What he's learning, he's living. And the more you live it, hey, the more you love it. And the more you love it, the more you want to learn it. The more you learn it, you be, the more you want to live it, you see? And the Bible says, and there's a blessed man. His life is not wasted. His life is rich. Well, there's a, there's a third thing now that we find here in Psalm number one. This guy who has distanced himself from wickedness. This guy who is deliberating on the word. This blessed man's life is developed by grace. You see, in in verse 3, there are some things told about this guy that speak of grace. Let's hear that verse again. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. There are, there's words of grace right in that verse. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, his life is grace planted. He shall be like a tree planted. Let me ask you, how did the tree get planted by the river? Well, it it could have been that an an acorn dropped to the ground where soil and water combined to stimulate germination, that it germinated and then began to grow. Or it could be that someone deliberately went to that spot and set out a seedling there by, by the river. But there's one thing we know. The tree did not plant itself. And I'm going to tell you, saved people are described in the Scripture as being in Jesus. And friend, you didn't plant yourself in Jesus. It was a matter of grace. It is what God did for you. For instance, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He pleased. You see, This man's life was grace planted. The Bible says he's like a tree. A tree is used to illustrate this man's life. He is like a tree that has been planted. And friend, you need to appreciate the grace of God. When you would have grown up wild, when you would have grown up wicked and rebellious, God's grace reached out to you and has now planted you in Christ. In fact, if you read Paul, Paul's uh, epistles, Paul uses a lot of prepositions to describe our relationship to Jesus, that we're in Him, we're of Him, we're by Him, we're through Him, we're for Him. Our relationship with Jesus. And friend, we, we're in that relationship by grace. Our lives are grace planted. Secondly, though, His life is grace provided. Again, the scripture says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. 
Now, just as that tree did not plant itself, so too the tree did not obtain its needed sources of nourishment. The soil and water were provided by someone else. Isn't that easy to equate in our lives as Christians? We're not the one who secured what we need. It's been done for us. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Did we get those blessings on our own? No. God has blessed us with them. What did Paul say in Philippians 4.19? Some of you know that from memory. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Our lives are grace planted. Our lives are grace provided. Also, we see with this man, his life is grace prospered. The Bible says that brings forth its fruit in its season. And he goes on to describe the, the fruitfulness and the vitality of this tree and how well it does. We know it's easy to read uh, these verses, read these words about the productivity of the tree. And if we're not careful to twist the words of the psalm into something that is self-serving and self-pleasing. But what does it mean now to be grace prospered? To prosper by grace. Well, let me give you some verses from Romans chapter 5. And, and I submit to you that they describe a truly grace-prospered life. Hear them. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, you see, grace planted, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I submit that these verses describe a truly grace-prospered life. It is a life that in the midst of and in spite of adversity is flourishing still, and that it's not of itself, but rather by the one who is in us, the Holy Spirit, who has blessed us by lavishing upon our lives the love of God. The Bible says has been poured out, and that, that is a picture of, of a very generous gift, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I said, there's a life that is prospering by grace, even in trials, even in great troubles. I was talking with someone this week who's, who's facing a real tough time right now. And while there's pain and, and while there's some things still to be struggled with and deal with and to work through, to be able to hear in the conversation. And in my mind, I'm thinking, that's grace. That's grace. Grace enabling him to think like that, to talk like that. Grace enabling him in spite of, in the midst of, you see. Because Paul has just told us in Romans uh, chapter 5, tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. What a life. What a blessed life to be able in the midst of pain to be able to, to see beyond and above and more than just the present difficult circumstance. A life that is grace planted, grace provided, and grace prospered. Is there any reason the Bible says, that's a blessed man? Well, now there's one other we look at before we conclude. In verse 4, 5, and 6, we see the blessed man's life 
is distinguished by God. In verse 4, 5, and 6, there is much said about the ungodly, the unsaved. And yet just a brief uh, phrase is stated about the righteous or, or the saved. And when you read verse 4, 5, and 6, you see the woeful reality of the ungodly, that is, the, the unsaved. He says, the ungodly are not so. What has just previously been said about the, the grace-blessed life, the ungodly is not so. But they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And at the end of verse 6, the way of the ungodly shall perish. It is a woeful reality. What is really the nature and the condition and even the prospects of the unsaved? William Ernest Henley was a British poet in the late 1800s. When he was a 16-year-old boy, due to tuberculosis, he had to have his left leg amputated. Just a few years later, there was the threat of the same thing having to be done to his right leg. But fortunately, through a series of surgical procedures, uh, the amputation was avoided. And while he was recuperating, convalescing, following those surgical procedures, he, he wrote a poem that in time eventually was given the title Invictus which is Latin for unconquered. Uh, it has been described as a sense of the Victorian stoicism, the stiffer upper lip of self-discipline. Hear what he wrote. He said, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Well, in stark contrast to the poet's platitudes of a supposed unconquerable human spirit, Psalm 1 very simply and rather coldly states, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away, that the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. The way of the ungodly shall perish. Now that's God's evaluation of the unsaved, the ungodly. And it will do no good as much as we might want to think like the poet wrote and, and have such a a high view of ourselves. The truth is that without God, our lives are empty and will be proven at judgment to be meaningless. But then there's a, just a very brief phrase spoken now about the righteous, the saved. With all that God said there about the unsaved, He simply says for the saved, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. In the Bible, when it speaks of knowing the Lord and the Lord knowing us, that's not just mental awareness, but it's speaking about a relationship that we have. In fact, the Bible uses the word know 
between a husband and wife. I, I quoted earlier where it said Adam knew his wife Eve. It's a very strong, intimate term of, of the relationship that they had that resulted in a conception and a child. And the Bible says the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Just this week in conversation with an individual who's going through something very difficult, he brought up the name of Job in the Bible. And Job, in, in the midst of his horrendous afflictions, in chapter 23, verse 10, said, speaking of the Lord, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. You sometimes the temptation when life is difficult is to entertain that notion, has the Lord forgotten me? Is the Lord even aware? And Job, he was blessed to be able to say, yes, he is. The Lord, he knows the way that I take. And friend, take that home to you now. Apply it in yourself. Say it to yourself. The Lord knows the way that, that I take. He's familiar with my ways. The Bible says the Lord is acquainted with all our ways. And even though you may go, go through a time of great testing, listen, as one of God's people, as one of God's children, hear me. God knows where you are and He knows what you're facing. And there is a, there is a divine purpose in the midst of all of the hurt that when you come out of this one day, and it might be when we get to heaven, but the writer says, when this time of testing is over, I shall come forth as gold. In other words, the impurities, the dross, has been removed by the fiery test, and I shall come forth as gold. And then Paul said this to Timothy in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. He said, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows them who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Oh, how beautifully what Paul says there goes with what we've read in Psalm 1. The two things that really stand out in, in Psalm 1. What, one, where we're, we're told about the blessed man, not, not traveling, not standing, not sitting with wickedness. But instead, he is, he is contemplating the Word of God continually. It has an effect upon his life. He's living a blessed life. That grace is just uh, enduing him with great blessings and, and giving to him great opportunities because God is at work in this man's life. And God knows him. You see, our responsibility is to depart from iniquity. God's responsibility is to keep you. He knows you. In fact, Jesus said of his sheep, he knows us by name. He knows you. He knows right where you are. He knows what you're facing. And that's what the psalm is teaching us here today. Our part is to live a life of spiritual distancing. There is nothing this world can give you that can aid you in your walk with God. But this world can do a lot of things to distract you from your walk with God. Don't allow this world, don't allow this world to come between you and your God. You make a conscious choice each day Hey, I'm going to walk with God. How do we walk with God? Through His Word, in prayer. Get in this Word, read it, dwell on it. And that'll be your artillery, your weaponry to withstand the world's efforts to draw you away from your walk with God. They tell us it's very good to practice social distancing. Well, we who name the name of Christ need to continually practice spiritual distancing. Hopefully with God's favor, the day will come when social distancing will not be an issue anymore. 
But rest assured, as long as you're living down here, spiritual distancing will be necessary. I want to encourage you to go back and reread Psalm 1 on your own. Put yourself in that psalm with a question mark. Does this describe me? Is this the kind of person I am? Am I a person the Bible would qualify as blessed? And I need to ask myself that same question because it's serious. Now, we're, we're constantly hearing from our president. We're hearing from the media. We're hearing from the medical personnel of the importance of these things they're telling us to do day to day to avoid this virus. God has taught us in His Word that it's important for us to depart from iniquity. May we be wise and may we be obedient. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, may we not just be now hearers of the Word, but may we be doers of the Word. For James told us, it is the doer of the Word that is blessed. I thank you that Psalm 1 is not just for one person, but it's for every person who will take it to heart and apply it in our lives. So Lord, may you be glorified. May the Spirit of God work effectively in our hearts. And may we, dear Lord, be resolved that here's the kind of person I want to be. That Lord, I want to be one that the Bible calls blessed. I want to be blessed so that in turn I might bless the Lord with obedience, with faith, love, service. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. Till we meet again. Our God is a consuming fire, burning holy flame with glory and freedom.